Welcome to ES310 Lesson 11. Today we're going to extend what we learned in Lesson 9 and 10 to the special case where we have what are called conservative forces. This will allow us to introduce the concept of potential energy and then use potential energy and kinetic energy in our conservation of energy principles in order to solve kinetic problems instead of using the work energy relationships. Let's start by talking about what a conservative force is. The definition of a conservative force is a force that generates work that is independent of the path, which means that it only depends on the initial and final positions of an object, not on the path that it follows. Such a force does no work on a closed path. So for example, if I lift a book up above my head and then return it to the table, I have done technically no work because Gravity is a conservative force, and I lift the book and then return it to exactly where it was, there's no work done, right? I do positive work lifting it, negative work returning it to the table, those two cancel out. As a reminder, work depends only on the position of the object, not on the velocity or the acceleration of the object. So examples of a conservative force would be a spring force as we stretch the spring or and then return the spring those two works ca cancel out, and gravity, like in the book example I just gave you. Examples of non-conservative forces are friction, right? Friction depends on the path. A long path, you have more friction. A short path, you have less friction. So friction is not conservative, which means the material we're covering today does not apply if we have friction. So this can only be applied in situations where we have no friction. When we have conservative forces, we create potential energy. The definition of potential energy is the measure of the amount of work that a conservative force does as a particle changes its position. So potential energy in this book uses the letter V. So kinetic is T, right? T is kinetic. And V is potential. In physics, you also often have PE for potential, KE for kinetic. But here we're going to use V and T. So the elastic potential energy is 1 half KS squared, where S is the stretch, just like it has been all along, right? So 1 half KS squared, potential energy due to a spring. Gravity has a potential energy of weight times the distance y, which can also often be written as mgh or y, right? So mg is just the weight, y is the height. This is relative to a datum. You get to pick that datum. So long as you use the same datum from all, for all the points you're looking at, it doesn't matter what pick, what datum you pick. So if we pick this middle datum here in this figure, if we go, if the ball goes from here upwards, then it gets positive potential energy. If it goes from the datum downwards, it gets negative potential energy, right? Because you go in a negative y direction, you get negative. You go in the positive y direction, you get positive. The total potential energy then is the gravitational potential energy plus the spring potential energy or the elastic potential energy. So let's take a look at an example of this. So we need to determine the potential energy for this two kilogram collar at points A and B. And we know that the unstretched, unstretched length of the spring is 200 millimeters or 0.2 meters. All right, so let's look at point A first. First of all, we need to pick a datum. So I'm gonna pick a datum down here at point A, which makes the gravitational potential energy at point A zero, which is so it's a convenient point to pick. So if we look at point A, the gravitational, which is mg y or h, is equal to zero, because y is equal to zero, the datum goes through A. The elastic, is 1 half ks squared. So we need to figure out what s is. Well, let's draw this spring. There we go. So s is the stretch in the spring. So 1 half k 
uh, let's call this distance uh, D. All right. So it's going to be D minus 0.2, which was the original. So the current length minus the original length of all things squared. Now let's find D. Well, D is a part of a triangle that has one leg that is 0.4, right? Two times the radius. And another leg that is 0.4. So D is equal to the square root of 0.4 squared plus 0.4 squared, which gives us 0.5 oops, 0.5656. So then if we plug in D over here, we get 0.5656 minus 0.2 gives us 0 0.365, 365 squared. So our elastic potential energy for A is 40. And our gravitational is zero, so our total VA is 40. Now let's look at point B. Our gravitational potential energy at point B, B is up here, right? This is point two, it's the radius. So is MGY, Y is above the datum, so it's gonna be positive. Mass is two, 9.81 times 0.4 plus 0.2. All right. Then our elastic potential energy is 1 half ks squared. This is now our distance. So this is d2. This was d1. Here's d1. d2 is part of a triangle also. Each side is 0.2, the radius. So 0.2 squared plus 0.2 squared, square root, gives us 0.2828. So if we plug things in over here, we have 1 half. K is 600. Uh, 0.2828 minus 0.2 gives us 0.828 squared. All right, and then the total V B is VG plus VE. Plug everything in, you get 13.83. So we picked a convenient datum where so that one of our gravitational potential energies was zero. We found the elastic potential energy based on the, the geometry of the problem. And then we added them together when we needed to to find the total potential energy. Now, once we have the total potential energy, we can use the conservation of energy principle if we have only conservative forces. All right, so energy is conserved if there's no non-conservative forces, which means that the kinetic energy at point one plus the potential energy at point one is equal to the kinetic energy at point two plus the potential energy at point two is equal to the sum of the potential and the kinetic energies at any point along the path of the object. If we're dealing with a system of particles, we just add up all of the kinetic energies, all the potential energies at each point. So the procedure here is we're going to apply conservation of energy. Generally, when we're interested in velocity and displacement, that is caused by conservative forces. So the key here is to remember conservative forces only. Generally, it's easier to apply than the work energy. Work energy, you can apply to any problem, right? There's no constraints on work energy, but work energy involves integrals when you're doing, dealing with paths, whereas conservation of energy only requires the beginning point and the end point. You don't have to worry about the path. So the procedure would be to draw the particle located at the two points, your initial and your final point, figure out what a convenient datum would be, then determine your kinetic energy, your gravitational potential energy, and your elastic potential energy for each location, and then apply the conservation of energy. So T1 plus, T, plus V1 is equal to T2 plus V2. So let's apply this then to the example we just did. So in the last example, we found that VA was 40 and VB was 13.83. And we put our, we had our datum down here at A. 
So we're going to use a conservation of energy. VA plus TA is equal to VB plus TB. VA is 40. TA is 1 half MVA squared. But we're told that it's released from rest at point A. So this is going to be 0. VB is 13.83 plus 1 half MVB squared. We know all of these things except VB, so we can solve for VB. VB turns out to be 5.13 meters per second. So one more example that will take us all the way through. And this is an example that is going to evolve the kinematics. We're going to have to think back to that first chapter that we did um, and remember our kinematics. So the idea here is we're trying to design a roller coaster. And we know that the loop in the roller coaster is going to be 20 meters above the ending point. We're trying to figure out what the height of A needs to be so that a car that's not moving at A gains enough speed and energy to make this loop without leaving the, the track at point B, and then we want to know how fast it's moving down at point C. So we have three points that we're interested in here. So we can write out our equation TA plus VA is going to equal TB plus VB is going to equal TC plus VC. All right. There's no springs involved here, so all of the elastic potential energies are zero. All we, all we have are gravitational potential energies. So kinetic energy at A is going to be zero because the idea is we release from rest at A, right, from rest at A. So this is going to be zero. Gravitational potential energy will be MGYA, and we're saying that this is the datum. Point C is at the datum. All right, so that's going to equal kinetic energy at point B, so 1 half mvb squared, plus potential energy at B, and B is 20 above our datum, so we've got mg times 20, and that's positive because it's above the datum. And then we have Tc, 1 half mvc squared, plus potential energy at C, the datum goes through C, so we get zero for potential energy at C. All right, now let's look at the first half of this equation. That's going to help us answer the question, what is Y, A? But we need to answer this question So they about V, B. So they give us this information that they don't want the car to leave the track at B. So if we draw a picture, a free body diagram of the car, at B, so here's the track, it's upside down, right? Um, then we have a normal force, the track is pushing on it with a normal force, and we have the weight, which is mg, and since this is going around a path and we're given the radius of that path, this is a good situation to be using the tangential normal coordinate system, right? normal pointing in towards this along the radius of curvature and tangential pointing in the direction of motion. And so now we can look at our normal direction, some of the forces in the normal direction. We've got N plus mg, and that's going to equal mass times the ex normal acceleration. Well, remember the normal acceleration is equal to v squared over rho. Now, if we don't want it, we want it the limiting case where it's just about to leave the track. That would be n equal to zero, right? So if n is equal to zero, then we have m mg equals mv squared over rho. So vb is equal to the square root m's cancel of rho g, which gives us 8.58 meters per second. Now we know VB, we can come back over to this expression, plug in VB. So we're looking at the first two sides. We've got MGYA equals 1 half M times 
0.58 squared plus mg times 20. There's an m in each case, in each one, so they cancel, and we can solve for ya, because it's the only unknown. So ya turns out to be 23.75, which in the diagram is called h. All right, now we're going to use the first one and the last one, because they're all equal. So we've got mg times our 23.75 is equal to 1 half m vc squared. M's cancel. You can solve for vc to be 21.6 meters per second.